you brought your Bible, and I hope you did, please turn with me to the book of Micah. The book of Micah, chapter 5. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, we have a stack of Bibles uh, at the Connect table in the back of the room. You're welcome to grab one of those. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, of course, we'd love to give that to you as a, as a gift from the church to you this morning. So the book of Micah, chapter 5. Micah may be uh, a book that you're not quite as familiar with. It may, it's one of the more challenging books to find. Uh, it's toward the end of the Old Testament. It's right in the middle of uh, what we call the minor prophets, just between Jonah and Nahum. Micah chapter 5. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we do come to you this morning, this first Sunday in Advent, and we offer to you our adoration and our thanksgiving for the joy to be together, to hear from your word, to sing songs, to worship together, to strengthen one another, to encourage one another. And Father, we are eager to hear from you. So Father, help us now to read and consider your word to us, your people. Give us eyes to see your glory pouring forth from the pages of this holy book. Grant our hearts to be stirred to an overwhelming delight in you. Father, this morning I pray that you would encourage the downcast. Give hope to the hopeless. Strengthen the weak and humble the proud. Strengthen our faith, O oh God. We pray this in the mighty and the glorious name of our Savior, our Redeemer, our Messiah, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, please read with me the book of Micah, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, just the first part of 5. This is the word of the Lord God Almighty to us this morning. Now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. May God bless the reading and the preaching of his holy word. I'll we'll have a confession to make this morning. I have been listening to Christmas music for weeks. I did not wait until after Thanksgiving. I was tempted to put on my Christmas lights before Thanksgiving, but I, uh, well, just ran out of time, didn't, didn't get around to it. But I love this season. I love Christmas season. I do love putting up lights. I do love decorating our house. Uh, I love singing Christmas songs. I love some of the songs that we sang this morning. I love, I'm, I'm so looking forward to the children's choir singing. It's one of my highlights of the year, so I'm so looking forward to that. I love Christmas season. But there's a danger in our culture of, uh, of simply, you know, being kind of a hallmark religion, a, a religion of sentimentality. Uh, one of the greatest dangers to the church is sentimentality, is simple, you know, nostalgia, you know, clouding our faith, clouding what, what it is that we celebrate. And Christianity is not a religion of sentimentality. It is not a religion of nostalgia. When we celebrate Advent, what we're celebrating is the coming of our king, a baby in a manger, yes, but also a ruler and a mighty king, a conqueror who rides upon a white horse. We are celebrating the promises of a sovereign God to his chosen people. We are celebrating that God in his sovereignty declared that a ruler would come, a once and future king would come. He promised a Messiah. And this season of Advent is a season of celebrating the fact that God has kept his word. He has kept his promises to us, that they have all come true. Mark Dever, uh, a pastor in uh, the D.C. area, has written a couple of large books uh, summarizing each book of the Bible. The book on the Old Testament, he has two volumes, one on the Old Testament, one on the New Testament. The title of the Old Testament book is Promises Made. And the title of the New Testament book is Promises Kept. And it's an apt summary. It's an apt description of the message of each testament. 
highlighting all the ways that Christ Jesus has fulfilled the numerous prophecies and numerous promises of our God. Our God, brothers and sisters, is a God who keeps his word. When he makes a promise, it always comes true, and that gives us real hope for our lives. Micah 5 contains one of these glorious prophecies, one of these glorious promises for us this morning, writing around uh, the, uh, the year 700 B.C., 700 B.C. So you know, just in case you're not connecting the dots, that's 700 years prior to the coming of Christ, which is very significant. Micah prophesied a number of very specific things about the Messiah that God declared before they would come to pass hundreds of years in advance. Friends, for those who've been around the church for any length of time, this may not be news to you that God promised and prophesied hundreds of years before things would come to pass. But this is astounding. This is not, this should not be old hat. This shouldn't be kind of, yeah, yeah, I I get that. I understand that. There is no other religion in the world that makes these kinds of claims. This is astounding. As, me, as most of you know, we, um, uh, we just sent a team to Nepal, and I was part of that team. And so we spent about uh, 10 days over in the country of Nepal, uh, strengthening you know, some brothers and sisters in the, uh, in the church over there, and going along with them on this discipleship trek. One of the, one of the more exciting things that we did was we trekked up uh, to Australian base camp, uh, which is part of the Annapurna uh, uh, trek. And so we got up to about 6,000 feet, and on the, mor- on the morning that we woke up, we rose uh, very early. Uh, so Josh and I uh, you know, got up very early, and we went out to watch the sunrise. And watching the sunrise over the Annapurna Mountains, the Annapurna, if you're not familiar, um, is not quite as well known simply because there's also Mount Everest. Mount Everest is you know, what, something like 29,000 feet. Well, Annapurna is 24,000 and, and change feet. I mean, it is huge. It's one of the tallest uh, mountains in the world. And so we get to watch the sunrise over these mountains, and it was amazing. And so Josh and I sat there, and we watched the sunrise, and we thought, wow, that's, that is really, that's, that's something else. But we heard somebody else who, who saw this maybe a little more deeply than we did, we, we heard someone, we heard a gentleman that was part of a, another you know, camp over here, and he was watching the same sunrise we did, but he didn't silently you know, just consider it. He was over there. We heard him because he was saying, wow! <laughs> he said it over and over and over again. It was like 5.30 in the morning, and this guy's over there just saying, wow! <laughs> it was almost annoying. But as he did it, I thought, okay, that guy is enjoying this on a deeper level than I am. And that's what I want us, that's what I'm after this morning, is I don't want us to simply know these things to be true in our heads, but I want us to feel them deeply within our bones. I want this to penetrate, you know, to the recesses of our hearts. I want us to feel the greatness and the majesty and the glory of this God who makes these kinds of promises, because it is amazing. This truth gives us great encouragement and real hope that even in the midst of hard times with difficult circumstances, our path is going somewhere good. There is hope for the future, that God is in control. He is totally trustworthy. We can trust him. He is fully reliable. Not a single word that God has declared come to pass will not come to pass. Not a moment of your life, brothers and sisters, not a moment of your pain and your suffering. Not a second of that is wasted when we walk with the Lord. That is profound, and that is real hope for us this morning. So let's dig into this text. This morning, we want to start off with a promise of the future king. Now, before we even get to our text, I just want to point your attention, maybe just across the page, it's one column over for me, to chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. You can just follow along as I read this. This this just provides a little bit of context for what we're digging into this morning. In that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted. And the lame I will make the remnant and those who are cast off a strong nation. And the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. And you, O tower of the flock, hill of the daughter of Zion, to you shall it come, 
the former dominion shall come kingship for the daughter of Jerusalem. So this scene that is painted of what will happen after the exile, a king is spoken of who will rule from Mount Zion, who will rule from Jerusalem, and who will rule forever. He will be the very definition of kingship, and he will do the most wonderful restoring work for the people of God. And it's picking up here that, uh, that the prophecy gets repeated again in Micah chapter 5. And this is like a, uh, it's like a wave that is hitting the shore. And then another wave comes in and hits that shore again. But it's the same sea that is pushing those waves against the shore. He's driving home the same point over and over again of this one who rules from Mount Zion from that day forth and forevermore. The one who is ladies and gentlemen, the one who is the very definition of kingship, who will come to the daughter of Jerusalem, not from the daughter of Jerusalem, but to the daughter of Jerusalem. And that's going to connect with what we read here in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So first of all, God signals in verse 1 that exile is coming. He says, muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Siege is laid against us. With a rod, they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. So God is speaking to his people in Jerusalem, his people who uh, they thought they were so strong. They thought that they were doing so well. They thought that they could look after themselves, who thought that they had got, got God neatly in a box, that they had had their lives kind of all sorted out. They were prosperous. They were part of a powerful and wealthy empire, and yet they were so helplessly under threat. And one of the things that made them so hopeless and so sinful was their self-trust, was their trust in themselves and the trust of their own might. Micah was prophesying. It might help us to know Micah was one of those prophets who prophesied at the same time as, uh, as the well, maybe better known prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah uh, spoke something that was very well known at the time with this rise of the Assyrian threat. He speaks something that is very similar to what Micah is saying here in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, he says, Isaiah says to the people in Jerusalem who are trusting in themselves, he, they were trusting in their ability to form allegiances and look after themselves. So he's speaking to the same people, and he says to them, If you do not trust in God, you will not stand at all. When the future threat comes, if you haven't built by trusting God, what you've built will fail. What you've built will fall. Now that's a powerful and a helpful word for all the church, to any church, to any Christian, to any person building a life. What a helpful and timely word. If you do not trust God now, if you do not have faith in God now, you will not in the future when the trials come and the pressures build. You will not stand at all. So maybe you're setting out on life this morning. Maybe you're, you're, you're young, you're in school, you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, 40s, 50. What are you building? What, what are you building? And how are you building it? You see, if you build a life on your own abilities, if you build a life on your own reputation, if you build your life not on trusting God, for his mercy or on trusting on God for his wisdom, not on trusting God for his strength or for his values. If you build your life on the world's values that have frankly been so imported into the life of the church, if you build your life just kind of paying attention and nodding to God every now and then as the, as the one who's kind of there somewhere and, and so you kind of pay tribute, you drop some money in the basket, you know, on Sunday, if you're not trusting your heavenly father, you will still be able to be remarkably successful. You can still get all your hopes and dreams until, until the pressure comes and they come upon you and expose the weakness that this so-called strength has produced within you. And then you'll fall. And that fall won't be signal. You won't you know, get a little notification on your smartphone indicating that it's going to happen next Tuesday at 3 o'clock. But it will come. 
This is such a helpful message for us today. It's echoed here in Micah chapter 5, verse 1, because God is effectively saying here in Micah, listen, you haven't trusted me, have you? You're trusting in the strength of your own might. You're trusting in the strength of your troops. You've made yourself a city of troops. Well, you'd, you'd better muster those troops now because siege is coming. Because your enemies are at the gates. And you'd better prepare your troops for defeat. Because an enemy will come, the Assyrians, and they will lay a siege against you, he says. And they will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. So God says to Jerusalem, he says to the self-confident, powerful, highly religious Jerusalem, you are going to crumble. So that's coming. So where is hope found? He speaks this humbling, sober word to them. So where does hope come in? Well, the hope comes from somewhere else, doesn't it? The hope for proud Jerusalem comes from lowly, humble Bethlehem Ephrathah, small among the clans of Judah, least among the clans of Judah. The place that nobody would think to look for a king will actually be the place that the king comes from. The place that proud, worldly Jerusalem would never think a king. Bethlehem? Yes. Bethlehem. Not from Rome? No. Not from some powerful and impressive place like Egypt? No, no, he will come from Bethlehem. You see, what we don't appreciate is that the very significance of Bethlehem is its very insignificance in the eyes of, of the people of Jerusalem. It was an insignificant town. It is too little to be among the clans of Judah. It says in Joshua chapter 15, Bethlehem isn't even named among the hundred cities, the more than hundred cities given to Jerusalem. Bethlehem isn't even named. It's that unimportant. Bethlehem. And this, is, this shows us a pattern, a great pattern in the ways of God, in the way that God works. God chooses the weak. He chooses the small, the obscure, the insignificant, the lowly, the common. He chooses the unnoticed. God uses the insignificant as the very instruments through which he displays his strength and his glory. So that gives us hope for those of us who are unnoticed, for those of us who are insignificant in the eyes of the world. He chooses David, the least likely of all his brothers. He chooses David. Remember that moment, and they'll think, little David? You're choosing him? You're not his big brothers who are big and strong and impressive? He chooses Gideon's army, but not until he whittles it down to the bare bones, doesn't he? And he chooses Bethlehem, the small, insignificant town of Bethlehem Ephrathah as the place, as the birthplace of the Messiah to come. And of course, he must come from Bethlehem because that's where David came from. And the prophecies are that it will be somebody who will, going back to Isaiah again, it will be somebody who comes from the stump of Jesse who is from Bethlehem. I love the way uh, the Bible scholar Dale Ralph Davis, who wrote a fantastic little book on Micah, I love the way he puts this. He says, when Micah speaks of Bethlehem, he means not only little town, but he means Davidsburg. I love that. He wants to conjure up in our minds the whole episode in 1 Samuel 16 when Yahweh made his choice of David clear. And that, that in turn should dredge up memories of Yahweh's covenant with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He says, your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The future king, brothers and sisters, has his roots in that election and in that covenant. He is the fulfillment of God's promise, and that is what gives us hope today. The ancient, defiant, unbreakable promise of God. That gives us hope today. So Jerusalem gets this verdict from God, and they get this humbling prophecy. So who is this king, and what is he going to do? Look with me at verse 2. 
He says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. So what's he going to do? Well, first of all, he's going to rule. And he's going to rule over Judah and Israel. And he's going to rule for God. He's going to rule for God. He's not going to rule for himself, which is what previous kings have done and what they are doing and what some of the future kings would do in Jerusalem. No, he's not going to rule for himself. He is a king utterly unlike the kings of the world that they know. He's not going to rule for political glory or worldly success. He's not going to rule for the accolades of the people. He is going to rule for God. So all of God's values will be his values. They will be the aim of his rule. God's glory will be his purpose. The knowledge of God will be what he seeks to produce in his kingdom. Life lived according to God's kingdom principles will be what he sees to it that take place in his kingdom. Life lived for God will be the example to a people who live for God. He will rule for God. And second, he will be God. Look at this. The phrase whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. This phrase is almost a, it's almost a code phrase. Right? To say something like, he is from God, he is before time, and he predates everyone. It's a way of talking that is referring to God in other prophecies. You may remember this when we went through the book of Daniel. You remember what that, that wonderful title is, ascribed to the future Messiah, the Ancient of Days. So this one who is going to rule from God will actually come from God. He will be God come to us. He who's coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. But of course, he's coming, verse 2, he's coming out of Bethlehem Ephrathah. So what's being signaled here? It's not being spelled out in, in a full-blown doctrine of the incarnation. He's not saying, uh, you know, this is two natures and one person. It's not being spelled out as, um, you know, fully divine, fully human, but all in this one person, Jesus Christ. It's not being written in those terms, but that is what it's saying. Do you see that in the text? Do you see that in this word? That is what it's saying. Here is somebody who is human. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. And it simply doesn't get any more human than that. And he's also going to be God from ancient days, it says. And so this person who is man, this person who is God, this God-man will rule, and he will rule for God and for God's glory. This is a glorious promise of the Messiah to come. Look with me at verse 3. He says, Therefore he shall give them up. Israel will be abandoned. Until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, and then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. So yes, exile comes. Pain and trials will come. There will be a scattering. It will look as though God has abandoned his people. But in this one who is born in Bethlehem, a gathering together and a reconciliation will be given again to the people of God. He will not abandon his people. So this Messiah will rule for God. He will be God and man in one per person. He will be the point of reconciliation. He will be the rallying post around which the people of God come together. He will be the focal point of the people of God. He will be the gravitational center who will bring those who've been scattered all over the place back together into fellowship with God. And he will stand over this flock and he will shepherd them in the strength of the Lord. So unlike the kings of the world, he's not going to trust in political alliances. He's not going to trust in the strength and the size of this army. He's not going to trust his troops in the way that these other kings do. Rather, verse 4, he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. He's not in it for earthly glory. He's not in it to increase his popularity. He's doing it 
for God, and he's doing it in the strength of God, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And he is our peace. Look with me at this second half of verse 4. It says, And they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. That is, brothers and sisters, he will rule in such a way that everything that would threaten the life and the existence of his people, he will be Lord over that. Think about that. He will be Lord over that. It's the same kind of logic, isn't it, that we hear in the Great Commission. I will be with you to the ends of the earth. Do you remember who said that? Who is it that sends us out to make disciples to the ends of the earth? It is the one who is the Lord over all things because he has just abolished death by rising from the dead, and he has all authority and all power. So everything that would oppose the work of God Jesus Christ is Lord over. Everything that would oppose the gathering in and the peace of his people, he is king over that. And therefore, his people will live securely. You think of the woman in Proverbs who laughs at the future. They, they dwell securely for his greatness shall reach the ends of the earth and he will be their peace. He, him, he is their peace. So I want to ask you this morning, where are you looking to for peace in life? What brings you peace? Troubles abound in this life, don't they? There's enough to worry about with our work and our health. There's enough to drive us to anxiety with our relationships, the good ones as well as the difficult and the painful ones. There's enough to worry about with the people around us and what they say or what we wish they would say. We worry about our finances. We can extend this list quite a long ways, can't we? What is it that's on your list? There's enough to do with the ordinary circumstances of life that worry us and cause us fear and anxiety. And there... If that's not all enough, there is an enemy of our souls that will stir up that turmoil in our lives. And he will wake you up in the middle of the night. And he's stirring up those troubles, isn't he? Do you ever have that where you're laying there and then, and then something is just troubling you and it's giving you fear and anxiety and you can't sleep? You're driving to work and he's stirring away. You're on your way to the office and he's reminding you of all the things that you haven't done and the difficult conversations that await you and that meeting with your boss. You're not sure how that's going to go. So where are we going to find peace? Where are you going to find peace? Well, you're not going to find it in making sure that all the circumstances of your life are under control. Some of the most control freak people that I know are also some of the most anxious people that I know. No, you will only find your peace in Jesus. He is your peace. Him. Our peace is found in a person. Everything that he is, precisely because he is God and man, exactly because his greatness extends to the earth, to the ends of the earth, he is Lord over all things, precisely because he is standing over you and shepherding you. That's what causes us to dwell securely. That's why we can be at ease. That's why we can experience peace. That's why we can sleep soundly at night is because we know that we have a watchman who is standing on the wall watching over us. We can trust him because he is ruling for God and he is ruling in the strength of God. It's exactly because of all these things that he is your peace. He is the only peace that you are ever going to have in this life. He is your peace. And brothers and sisters, he is with us. I love that title ascribed to Jesus that we sang about and that we read about this morning, Emmanuel. 
God with us. Notice here in this text, he is with the flock. He is with us. He will stand and shepherd his flock. You see, he is with you. So this morning, are you worried? Are you troubled? Jesus is with you. Do you believe that? Do you sense that? And everything that can come against you, absolutely everything and anything that can come against you, he is Lord over that. There is nothing that you are worried about this morning. There is nothing that is out of control. That doctor's report that you're waiting for, the results of that test, how you're going to pay your bills, what's going to happen with your child who you're just not sure how it's going to go with them. He is Lord over that, and therefore, we can trust him. There is nothing that you are facing this morning that Jesus Christ is not Lord over, nothing at all. No illness, no disaster, and they, they are coming. The Assyrians are coming, and after that, the Babylonians. But there is nothing that your shepherd, that your king is not Lord over. In addition to that, there is no one that he is not Lord over. Who are you troubled by this morning? Who are you scared of? Who is it that intimidates you? Who is it that at work, they make you feel this small when they talk to you? Who is it in your family who knows how to rile you up and they delight in doing so? Who knows how to hurt you? Listen, you don't have to take opposing them upon yourself. Jesus is Lord over them. And so you can get on with loving them and leave the rest to Christ. He is at work and he is sovereign. So whatever is to come, our good and faithful shepherd will see us through it. You will encounter, you will encounter trials and troubles of all kinds, but God will see you through it. He does send us out, brothers and sisters, as sheep among wolves, but because of him, we will end in triumph. Please pray with me. Just kidding. I have more. <laughs> See, my notes, they're a mess. <laughs> Welcome to my world. In closing, is what I meant to say. <laughs> Friends, in closing, I want to exhort you to lay down your striving, to despair of your hope in your troops and your own ability and your own might. Lay down your anxieties. God invites you to give them to him because he cares for us. Lay down your warfare against others. Of all the late nights worrying about how to say it better, to show them just how right you are, give these things to God. Your job is to trust him and to demonstrate your trust in him in the way that you reflect that you are his child, in the way that you reflect his character. That when we are reviled, we don't revile in return. The book of Micah and the promise of Christmas reminds us that the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. That is the unshakable truth for every man and woman who entrusts themselves to God. The best is yet to come. God has assured us of this. He has secured it by his sovereign will and he has purchased it by the blood of his son. Micah's prophecy promised us hundreds of years in advance that the Messiah would be born. And it reminds us this morning that God's kingdom will come in fullness, not because, not because the conditions are perfect, not because the stars are in alignment, but because almighty God has declared it to be the case. He has promised it to be, and nothing and, and no one can overthrow his will. Count on that, brothers and sisters. I say this to the young and the healthy, those who have their whole lives ahead of you. And I say that also to the older saints, those who, who are feeling the effects of aging, whose outer self is wasting away, and who can, who can smell heaven approaching. 
quickly. The best is yet to come. God sees to it. God is at work in the darkest of times for our good and for Christ's glory. He will see to it that the glory of his Son is made known to the ends of the earth. And he will see to it that everything in your life works together for good. Nothing is wasted. Every millisecond of every day is working together for your good. That is the promise of Christmas in Christ Jesus, our Messiah. The glory of the prophecy of Micah is that God keeps his promises. We can trust him with our lives. We can trust him with our hopes and dreams. We can trust him with our fears as well. So take heart, brothers and sisters. Take heart. The promise that God has here made to his people is for you and me this morning, and it is unbreakable irrevocable, constant, and true. And that gives us hope for our lives this Christmas season. Now, would you pray with me? (laughs) Almighty God, faithful Father, glorious Savior, We thank you this morning for the gift of your holy word. We thank you for your faithfulness to us, your people, despite our lack of faithfulness toward you. We thank you for your steadfast love. And we thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Father, for sovereignly declaring your plan of redemption and for seeing it through in every detail. Father, we are hopeless apart from your work. And we thank you for Jesus, for fulfilling your prophetic word, for keeping your promises by being born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the place of weakness and poverty and insignificance, the least likely of birthplaces for a king. Thank you for his life of holiness faithfully fulfilling your perfect will for us. Thank you for his active obedience, which purchases our righteousness and for his passive obedience and bearing the penalty for our sin. We thank you for the hope that we have because of your strength and not our own, because of your word and because of your promise. Father, how can we thank you enough? Well, this morning, Father, we pray that you would lift up our gaze, that you would write it deep in our bones, Father, in the recesses of our hearts, that the best is yet to come, that God's word is true, that the anticipation we have and the hope of a Messiah is true in Christ Jesus. Strengthen us, Father, as we run this race with renewed zeal and empower us to shine brightly everywhere we are this Christmas season, Father. Let it not be a superficial sentimentality that perfumes our homes, but a deep and abiding and confident and sure hope in Christ Jesus. And give us the peace and the freedom that comes in trusting in you. We pray this in Jesus' name.